Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Fraser. I am with the Southeastern New England chapter of PRSA. Um, I think we've got a great program ahead of you. Um, and it's made possible by our generous sponsor, M&T Bank. Um, as a reminder, our hashtag is PRXNE18, and um, the Wi-Fi is May 2018. So with that, I will uh, introduce Sophia Tokar and Brian Piper. Hi, everybody. Um, first of all, we want to thank you for coming to our presentation today, Optimizing Your Web Writing for People and Search Engines. Just a really brief introduction. My name is Sophia Tokar. I'm the Web Writer and Communications Officer uh, for Art Sciences and Engineering at the University of Rochester. So what does that mean? It means I write for the web. Um, it's a great gig, and I've learned a lot about writing for the web and teaching web writing over the years, so I'm glad we'll be able to share some of that with you. Brian Piper is our SEO and Digital Analytics Pro, and he's got a lot of great information to share with you as well. So we're going to kind of delve right into it, um, but feel free to kind of stop us along the way if you have any questions. We're going to do our best to stick to, to our time limit and make sure we leave time at the end for questions. So, optimizing your web writing. So your first priority whenever you're writing or creating any kind of content for the web is to create high quality content. Well, what does that mean? That means that your content is focused on the user, that it's informative, and that it's engaging. And that in and of itself is gonna be the biggest driver of any kind of traffic, search engine or organic having just good, high quality content. Um, and in addition to things like content amplification and outreach, but good, good content. So content is king. But how can we create that good content that's user-centric, informative, and engaging? Well, step one is to write for people, not search engines. Um, you know, you always wanna remember the human. Humans are the ones who are consuming your content, and so we want to create content for them. And you want to start by identifying your target audience. Who are the people who are going to be most interested in uh, reading or consuming this content? Uh, and you know, sometimes we meet with clients at the university departments, and they're like, well, our audience is everyone. And we're like, no, everyone is not an audience. It's a fantasy. Um, <laughs> So, so narrow it down, and you're going to have your primary and your secondary audiences, uh, but you're going to want to at least be able to know clearly who you're writing for. Now, despite all the, the different kind of audiences that are out there, um, there are some commonalities between how we all as people read on the web. So we want to get into a little bit of that. So on the web, people do what's called hyper-reading. They skim, they scan, they peck in order to find what they need, uh, and that's to, to satisfy a goal, uh, complete a task, or to answer a question. It's this idea of, um, you've probably heard this term, satisficing. So it's like you satis you're satisfied with your answer as soon as you find it. So you're just kind of muddling through, trying to get what you need, and then you move on to the next thing. You probably have a lot of tabs open at the top, and as soon as you're done with something, you move on to the next thing. That's just the reality of the way people are on the web, and that's, that's okay. Um, but we have to be aware of that and realize that. So the Nielsen Norman group, they do a lot of web usability and accessibility research, um, and they've done a ton of studies. I highly recommend you check out their website. Um, but one of the things they found is that most people will leave your website after only about 10 to 20 seconds. Think about that, that is not a lot of time. So you only have basically 10 seconds to prove your value proposition to someone. Now, if you do that, then they'll actually stay on your website or on your email. But if you don't, they'll leave and go somewhere else to find the answer that they're looking for. Um, another interesting statistic from Nielsen Norman is that uh, the average user only reads about 20% of the words on an actual web page. Now this is very distressing to a writer like me who agonizes over her word choice, her turn of phrase, you know, finding that, that perfect synonym. And uh, then to find that people are only reading 20%, you're like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, either way, I get paid sometimes by the word, um, and other times not, and all right, let's, let's know that. 
Um, and finally, it's this idea that when people are online, they read in what's called the dominant reading pattern. It's an F shape. So you can see it kind of looks like the letter F. They pay most attention to the top and the side. Um, and that's true also in languages where the writing is, is reversed. So in something like Hebrew, where it goes the other way, you see a reversed F pattern. Um, so it means, again, that people are scanning the page. They're trying to find kind of inroads and inlets uh, to see if this page is meeting their needs. So, so what can we then do if the, if the reality of web writing is this F-shaped pattern uh, and the 20% and the 10 seconds? Yes? So I have a quick question. Is sure. this all really informative so far? Are your slides going to be available at the conference? Yes, all okay. of our slides are going to be available. Very good. Yep, yep. to make sure. <laughs> and again, I, I highly recommend checking out Nielsen Norman because they have just a lot of information out there. Um, they were kind of the early pioneers in doing a lot of this, this research. Um, so yes, how people read online. Um, so we want to start by, of course, identifying who our users are, what their needs are, so that we can give them uh, the information or the things that they want. Um, but also, when it comes to this idea of creating audience-oriented content, uh, we want to use what's called the inverted pyramid. So if any of you are journalists or have taken a class in journalism, this is probably very familiar to you. You've seen this idea of uh, the inverted pyramid. And it's this idea of uh, front-loading your content. So what does front-loading mean? Front-loading means putting the most important information at the beginning. At the beginning of the page, at the beginning of the paragraph, at the beginning of the sentence. And this is kind of new to a lot of people in our field in higher education who are used to academic writing. Academic writing is long, it's mm -hmm. verbose, it tends to kind of save the punchline for the conclusion section. Um, <laughs> but 10,000 words later, you're lucky if anyone's still reading. <laughs> so we, we have to kind of retrain or reteach a lot of our academics when we're working on their websites that most people are not going to read to the end of the web page. Uh, so why does front loading work? Front loading works because it orients your reader. People are very used to this style of reading, especially when it comes to something like newspapers. Headline, the first paragraph tells you everything you need, and then you're moving on from there. Background information as you move toward the end of the paragraph or the end of the story. Um, but the front loading also works because it increases um, readers' speed, so how quickly they can read, how well they recall, and how well they comprehend the information. Um, and it also, again, recognizes the fact that some readers are never going to get to the end of your web page. So there's no reason in saving the punchline until the end. So how can we apply this? As I mentioned before, you want to organize your web page or your story or your content with the most important information at the beginning, at the top, at the front. Um, and then at the, at the paragraph level or even at the sentence level, if possible, you want to be applying this technique. So the first few words or the first few characters of your headline, of your subject line, of your section headings, all of these are going to be useful because as people are going through that page and that F pattern, they're looking at those beginnings and taking that in. And they might not even read to the end of your section heading. Um, and that's just the world we live in. So I want to talk quickly about some specific writing techniques that you all probably have intuited from your years of being on the web. Um, but we're going to formalize them a little bit. Uh, and you can take these and start applying them to your next tweet uh, as soon as you leave this room, really, or even in this room. And those effective writing techniques are, broadly speaking, concise text, uh, scannable layout, plain language, and the conversational style. So we're going to delve into each one of those things. Let's start with concise text. So in 2017, Twitter upped the character count on their tweets from 140 to 280. Double the number of characters, that's great. Um, now, even so, research has found that the ideal tweet length hovers around 100 characters. So this is just a lesson to us that we should still always aim to be clear and concise uh, in our content, whether that's on social media or on the web. Um, and again, this is very much the opposite of academic writing. So it's retraining a lot of people and <laughs> how we've been taught, even in college writing. Um, so I always tell my writers to aim for about uh, five sentences per paragraph, about 20 sentences per word, or 20 words per sentence, 
Um, and one sentence paragraphs are okay too. I uh, warn a lot of people who come from a journalistic background that you don't want your entire web page to be a series of one sentence paragraphs that can be almost as difficult to read as a wall of text. So, you know, some variability. Keep things interesting for your readers visually. It's really important. But always tighten up your prose. Um, just one of the examples, this is actually a real world example from our institution. I had to like take this sentence. It was, um, the institution utilizes an approach that emphasizes holistic care. And I was like, I, I had to write that sentence down on this three by five card because I was like, I can't remember it. Why don't we just say we emphasize holistic care? Take out all the garbage kind of junk words, tighten it up. And again, if people are only reading 20%, I don't want them wasting their time on a word like utilize. Can we get an amen? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or on things like, you know, an extra space after a period. Yeah. Um, and now that said, there's still very much a place for long-form content on the web. I know everyone's like, short, short, short. Um, but long-form content is very much alive, especially on mobile devices. Think about it. You know, Sunday morning, you wake up, you know, you check Twitter or Facebook. There's an article that catches your eye. People will read that New York Times article, that BuzzFeed article. So, so there is life for long-form content especially, as Brian will talk about, uh, when it comes to search engine optimization as well. It's just that you don't want long-term content when you're trying to get something done. So if I'm in the kitchen baking cookies and I want to find out how many quarts are in a gallon, I don't want to read a 2,000-word dissertation on the U.S. measurement system. I just want to know what the answer to that is. And Google's getting very good about just serving up those answers uh, instead of even making you click through anymore, something we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. Uh, and quickly, too, when it comes to something like concise text, uh, when given the choice between being clever or being clear, always opt for clarity. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do both. Uh, but in, when it comes to your headlines, subject lines, and section headings, you want to be as clear as possible. I'll give you a real world example. Um, my boss sent me on assignment, and I came back with an article, and I thought I had a very clever headline. It was called uh, Close Encounters of the Nerd Kind. And what do you think that story is about? Oh my god, it could be about anything. <laughs> Nerds, I guess. Um, and she was like, love the story, it's great, but I'm kicking it back to you. I need you to include this particular keyword in it. Now let me see if you guys can guess what the keyword was. So I sent it back to her with a new headline, and it's Hack to the Future, Rochester's first 24-hour hackathon. You can probably guess what the keyword is there. Uh, if not, it's hack. Anyway, <laughs> and yes, this is a longer headline, but actually research has shown that longer headlines tend to have a better click-through rate. So anywhere from 90 to 99 characters is a pretty good length for a headline. Um, and so that, you know, that being concise, it's not a hard and fast rule. You want to be, be smart about it. That strunk and white idea of omit needless words but the emphasis there is really on needless. So if something's a keyword, that's not a needless word. You want to include that in your headline, even if it makes it a little bit longer. Again, something we'll talk about a little bit more in depth with Brian. Next, we want to talk about this idea of scannable layout. So this, <laughs> this is actual copy from uh, the Washington University of St. Louis's Anthropology Department's website, their about page. Um, and I just took it from their web page and plunked it into a Word document so you could see what we're working with. And it's, like I said, the dreaded wall of text. Um, now these are lovely, fine people. Um, Washington University is a great school, so I'm not picking on them. I just want to show you and demonstrate to you how doing some of these very easy things can make this more readable and more accessible. Uh, for people. So this is our, our before, and now we're going to do like a what not to wear. <laughs> this is our after. There's a before, and there's the after. So, so what did we do here? Now, this is more or less the exact same words that were on the previous page, but we've increased the scannability of this content. How? Well, for one thing, we made shorter sentences uh, and shorter paragraphs. Added just some paragraph breaks. So you see how that white space adds some breathing room to this content. It gives people a foothold when they're coming and they're looking at that F shape. 
I can see, all right, here's a foothold, here's a foothold. There are ways to get into this copy in a way that simply doesn't exist. Here. We're also using headings. Uh, proper HTML headings. So this is the kind of the coding side of things, the basic coding uh, that you can do in any wizzy way. So main heading, heading one, and then we have where section headings, heading two. Um, again, making these very clear, digestible. These section headings act as signposts for your readers so that in that 10 seconds that they're on your page, they can see quickly what it's about. Is this the page that's gonna answer my question? Okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time here. This is not the page, I'm gonna go somewhere else. Using lists and tables, Lists and tables stand out on a page, they draw the reader's eye, and so then someone's gonna spend a little bit of time over there. Um, using things like, and I didn't as much here, but bolding and italics, um, use those very judiciously. Uh, I always tell my writers, if everything is bolded, then essentially nothing is bolded. Um, so really just bold the most important things. Try to avoid using italics uh, to extend it, because italics can be difficult to read on a page, on a web page. Um, and never underline for emphasis. Um, underlining is associated with hyperlinking and users get very frustrated when they see something that they think is a link, click on it, and then it doesn't go somewhere. So don't frustrate your users when they might leave. Um, and finally, hyperlinking. Uh, hyperlinking appropriately creating these meaningful and descriptive hyperlinks so that a person has a sense of when they click on that, what's gonna be on the next page. Um, there's nothing worse for for readers, sighted readers, as well as screen readers, for people who are visually impaired, than just having a bunch of links that say, click here, click here, click here, click here. That forces the reader to do a lot of work, because they have to go to the click here, read either side of it to get a sense of what this is about, and only then can they move on and figure out, is this something I want to click on or not. So again, very just pretty basic things that we're doing here uh, to make this more scannable. And then it's this idea of plain language. So what is plain language? It means using the words that your users use. So you wanna avoid excessive jargon or marketing speak. Um, let's face it, online people's bullshit detectors are turned up to 11. They just <laughs> see through this stuff. Um, so one of the ways to kind of check yourself, uh, before you check yourself, is this idea of the neighbor or the grandma test. Um, so you wouldn't go over to your neighbor's house or your grandmother's house and ask, you know, may I borrow some C12H22011? Um, that's kind of a jerk thing to do. So, so you want to just use their words. Can I borrow some sugar? Um, and that is actually good for both humans and for search engines. Something Brian's going to talk about. Think about it this way, you, you wouldn't, you know, if you're doing a Google search, you don't search for something like a, a value price travel experience. You type in cheap plane tickets. So use those words. <laughs> People are going to find you uh, if you use the words that they're looking for and, and think like a user. But, but, um, if your primary target audience uh, is using C12H2011, uh, then, then that's okay. Uh, to use those words. So I would say like if your primary target audience, in our case we have a physics department, if they are physicists, um, then you probably don't have to spend a ton of time explaining the gravitational acceleration on Earth. Um, I would need that explained to me, but they don't. So it's like you could actually do yourself some harm. Um, so keep your audience top of mind. But, 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 another caveat. Um, even those high literacy users uh, those people with PhDs, those people who are, are very educated, even they want content that is scannable, that is verifiable, and that is factual. Okay. And finally, the conversational style. Um, that's that idea of using the first and second uh, person constructions in your sentences. I, you, we, our. Um, and that's because there's Research has found that there's a negativity bias in digital communication. So what does that mean? That means that something that has a positive tone online is interpreted to be neutral. Something that's neutral is interpreted to be negative. This is the reason why so many of us use things like emojis and GIFs in our text messages or our tweets. Because that negativity bias is there, we kind of have to combat it a little bit. One of the other ways you can combat it is by using the conversational style. Uh, that you, we, our, I language really warms up your prose online. Um, and it creates a kind of personal connection with your reader. So that's a good thing. 
So together, all of these things, the uh, concise text, the scannable layout, the plain language, the conversational style, they increase readability and accessibility of your web content. And the best part is, it's a twofer. It's good for search engine optimization as well. So as we mentioned before, it's not just humans who read your web pages. It's also machines. This is where I turn it over to my esteemed colleague. Thank you so much. <laughs> so everybody works really hard on their content. Everybody sp spends a lot of time crafting their words. And then Sophia comes in and tells you that people only read 20% of that. <laughs> <laughs> that can be a little disheartening. But don't worry, because search engines read 100% of it. They read every <laughs> word you write. <laughs> but that being said, Content is king. Write for your audience. Don't write for the search engines. The only time you should take the search engine into consideration is when you have a choice between two different words and it doesn't change the meaning. Then you want to use the word that is that has the higher search volume on the search engine. Because if you don't use high volume keywords in your content, it won't show up on the search engines. So why does it matter? Why do you want to be on the search engines? I know it seems like a silly question, right? There are a lot of people in the world, and we're living in an age where more than half of those people are online, most of them on mobile. It's a huge audience that you have the potential to reach, but you're not going to reach them if they can't find your content. 93% of all online experiences begin with a search engine. Most people skip the ads because people know what the ads are. Most people never go to the second page of the search results. 90% of search traffic, of organic traffic, is driven by the first page of returns, the first 10 returns in Google. You can see number 11 gets a little bit of a hit because it's at the top of the second page. More than 35% of traffic is driven to the first search result. Very important to be on your first page of Google results for your content. So I'm going to be talking about Google search results, but what I say really goes towards every search engine, YouTube, Yahoo. But we talk about Google because Google has the market share. You can see there are a few sad people that still use AOL. I don't know why, okay? but it still made the list. <laughs> Sorry for anyone who does use AOL. I, I, have, I have friends that still use AOL. So. Um, but we're going to be talking about Google primarily. Um, anything that you do on Google will also work the same on your other search engines. When you put your keywords into Google and you, you search for something, you get a whole variety of different different returns here. Um, so your paid words are always at the top. Most people know those are paid, they skip right over. Mm -hmm. Your rich snippets or featured snippets are now starting to show up more in Google. You get uh, the list of questions when you type something in, right? You see those, oh, well, this answers my question. And a lot of people just like scan through those and like, oh, that's interesting, I'll click on that. Then you get local search, very important. You want to have, if you're doing selling locally and you have a local business, you want to make sure you have claimed your address in Google in your listing because otherwise you're not going to show up in the local search. And then organic, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about today is optimizing your content for organic search, which should be driving the majority of your online traffic. So what does good content look like? You spend all this time writing content, creating this great content, you put it up on your website, you promote it through social, you put links to it in your newsletter, it gets great initial hit, and then it just kind of goes flat. And that is what a lot of content looks like when you put it out there. Good content looks like this. This is, and you don't see any huge spikes. You don't see any big, you know, oh, the, got, the post got picked up on Reddit and 60,000 people, you know, read it in one day. But this is just nice, consistent, across the board, driving a lot of traffic. And that's because it's optimized for search. So Google uses an algorithm to rank everything. And Google won't tell us what that algorithm is. It's about 200 different factors that they use, and they update it 20 or 30 times a year. So it's constantly evolving. But they tend to kind of stick to the same things. And every year, there's a company called SEM Rush that does a, a, a big study. They put a lot of content up. They see what ranks, and they see why it ranks. And so last year, this is what the results came back with. Most search results are driven by the amount of visits your website gets. So it's kind of a, a cycle, right? You optimize your content for search, you get more traffic to your page, you get higher in the rankings. It's kind of a, a cycle that way. 
They want people to spend time on your website. That's where good content comes in. If you're writing content that is interesting to people, they will stay on your website and they will read your content. They want multiple pages per session. They don't want people to, to come in, read one article, and then leave your website. So you've got to have in there, you've got to have hooks to pull people deeper into your site, related articles, related content. Oh, you want to check this out. You want a low bounce rate, right? A bounce is somebody comes to your site, they look at your page, they're like, that's not what I want, and then they leave. Or sometimes they read the entire article, but if they don't go to another page on your site, Google doesn't count that time on page, and if they leave your site, it counts as a bounce. So having those hooks to other content on your page and having a good meta description, that description that comes up when you do your search on Google, you want that description to be accurate because if they read that and then they go to your page and that's not what it is, they're going to leave because that's not what they want. You want referring domains. You want other sites pointing at your content. The better the, the authority of those sites are, the better it's going to help your rankings. And last year, the big push for Google was uh, HTTPS. They wanted everybody's sites to be secure. If your site is not, doesn't have an SSL certificate and your data doesn't come through an HTTPS, it's going to affect your rankings. And then we get to keywords, which is mostly what I'm going to be talking about today, and how keywords directly affect your position on the search engines. So search engine optimization and content creation. When do you start optimizing your content for the search engine? Well, if you already have an idea of what content you want to write, what topic you want to write on, that's great. If you're looking for topics, go to Google Trends. It'll tell you what people are searching for. You can, you can search by industry. You can search on a particular term. You can see what's already driving traffic out there. If you're looking for what's driving traffic in the social area, you can look at BuzzSumo. It'll tell you these are the things that are driving traffic. This is where social traffic is going right now. Another great thing you can use BuzzSumo for is you can put in your competitor's website and you can see what your competitor is using in the social arena to drive traffic. So once you've got an idea of what content you want to write, then you want to figure out what's already out there. You don't want to write the same content that's already out there that's already been up on the web. So Google, right? Google's a great resource for doing search engine optimization. So figure out what's already out there, and then don't write the same article. Don't use the same headline. Don't use the same content. So you've got your subject. You know what you want to write about. Now we're going to talk about keyword research. So this is the most important, like, 10 minutes of, of my presentation. So you can fall asleep during all the rest of them. Stay awake, kids. So when you start doing keyword research, we have a list of what we call strategic keywords. You should know your key strategies. You should know which keywords you want to try to integrate into your content as much as possible to set yourself up as an industry leader or thought leader in that particular area. So we have a, a shared Google Doc that we use for everyone. We put up, and there's a couple of columns that you can see here that we, we have. Next to every keyword in our list, we have a column of monthly volume, how many people search on that term every month, and then we have a keyword of number of results. Who are you competing with? How many other websites out there are serving up your same content? And then there's a, a third field that's, that's cut off here, but um, it's the difficulty score. So it's just your number of results divided by your monthly volume. So you've got to find a balance in keywords that have a lot of volume, but not a lot of competition. So most of our strategic keywords are what are called um, short tail keywords. So short tail keywords are one or two word phrases or one or two word terms that usually have high volume, but they usually have really high competition. So first I'm going to show you how to research short tail keywords, how to get the right keywords for your content, and then we're going to go into how to find long tail keywords. Because what you really can get, you can really break through on your search on long tail keywords, it's much easier. So if you use AdWords, there's a keyword planner tool right within AdWords. If you don't have an AdWords account, uh, neilpatel.com is a, a great website, a lot of resources, but he has a tool on there called Ubersuggest. You can just Google Uber, Ubersuggest and it'll, it'll take you to that. But you basically put in your keyword, right, whatever content topic you think you're going to write about, and it will tell you what the search volume is for that in a month, how many people in a month search for that term in Google. And then... It tells you all these keyword suggestions. Here's all the other terms that are similar to yours that people may search on. 
So if we were looking at research universities, so a thousand people a month search on research universities, probably going to be pretty difficult to get up to the top of the, the search results. There's probably a lot of research universities out there that have content online. Only a thousand people a month search on it may not drive a lot of traffic that way. So if we start looking for other keywords that we may want to include in there, colleges in New York, 40,000 people a month search on that. So then you start adding those keywords to that document. I just create an Excel document and just create a list of all the keywords that I think might be worth researching. So then I drop that 40,000 into the volume. I drop research universities, put 1,000 in there. And then you can start getting an idea of what keywords are really going to be best for you to try to include in your content to get the most organic traffic. Then you got to look at competition. So how many other people are doing that? So we were working on an article about virtual reality and using virtual reality in biomedical training. Um, so if you're just trying to figure out, well, do I want my title to be virtual reality used in learning or VR used in learning? Just in looking at the volume, man, you had almost twice as many people searching for VR every month. So it seems like VR is the easy choice. But then you want to make sure you're looking at the searches versus the number of results. So when you enter this term into Google, and you hit return, right underneath your keyword, it shows you the results. That's how many people you're competing with. There's 162 million websites out there that have virtual reality somewhere that show up in the Google rankings for virtual reality. VR is about 632 million. So you're much better off using virtual reality instead of VR as your keyword. Now that's short tail keywords. So now you want to start looking at longer tail keywords. How are you really going to, because people aren't just going to go in and search VR and expect to find anything worthwhile. They're going to search, you know, VR used in learning or VR used in education. So you got to start thinking about how people are searching. And the best way is to think about how you search. If you're looking for the content that you're writing, what would you put into the search engine? There's a bunch of great sites out there to figure out exactly what people are looking for. Answer the public, you put in your keyword phrase, and it gives you all the questions people are asking related to that content. Reddit, Quora, great sites that are, people are just going on there and asking questions. What's the number one research university in the United States? Well, there you go. There's another keyword phrase to put into your, into your chart. And of course, Google. Once you start typing something into Google, you will notice that the autocomplete feature will tell you exactly what other people are searching for. That is what other people are typing in in their searches. When you hit return down at the bottom, you'll usually get searches related to a whole other list of great long tail and short tail keywords to put into your document. So you got your keywords, you figured out what's got the best uh, search volume with the lowest competition. You kind of got to balance those out. So then where do you put those keywords in your content to make sure that your content's going to appear as high on Google as possible? So this is an article we did about 20 tips to get into your dream college. And dream college was the short tail keyword. Get into your dream college was a longer tail keyword that we were optimizing for. Page names. Your page names are very important. You want to put your keywords in your page names. You want to separate words with hyphens because underscores, Google reads that as one big word, or if you run all your words together, Google doesn't know what that means. So use hyphens to separate your keywords. Your headers, right? You want to use your H1 tags, your H2 tags. Google wants to see your keywords in all of your page headers. Copy. Put your keywords into your body copy. Now don't keyword stuff and just repeat your keyword over and over and over because Google will penalize you for that. Image names. The names of your images matter. Your images also have alt tags, which are primarily used for uh, screen readers, uh, for accessibility, for visually impaired people. But you can also put your keywords in there. I think the, the title for this image is Yes Banner, Get Into Your Dream College. It's kind of a weird thing, but usually when I'm doing my alt tags, I just take the from the picture and use that as the alt tag? Is that like a bad thing to do? Is it a good thing to do, a useful thing? Um, it, it doesn't really, it, it's not a bad thing, mm -hmm. especially if your keyword is in your caption. Mm 
Yeah, which is a great place. Screen readers, and I figure I want people to have that full information. Well, they're gonna if if you have a caption, they'll get it from the caption though. Okay. So oh, yeah, it may so be redundant for okay. them to to read that or to hear that, mm -hmm. and then to hear the caption, and it says the exact same thing. Yeah. So you may be better off shortening that up. Mm -hmm. And whenever you can put your keywords into your content, the earlier you can put it in the mm -hmm. content, the better. <coughs> so if you have get into your dream college yes banner. You know, and it may not make as much sense on a screen reader, but most people know image. You know, the, the screen reader will tell them it's an image. I always tell my writers that when they're writing alt text, and like uh, instead of repeating the caption, uh, because people who are visually impaired are often using it, try to describe the image as concisely as possible, like you would to someone over the phone. Yeah. Um, and then that way, it just lets you really narrow it down, and you don't get focused too much on things like you know. Uh, yeah, things like, you know, someone's facing left or whatever. That's not the main thing. It's just really what what is the essence of the photo so that someone can get that a similar experience as if they were sighted. Thank you. I ask questions on yes. the divine alt tag. Oh. So uh, within so the HTML code that surrounds your content, whenever there's an image, there's an alt tag. Now it's just primarily used for accessibility. It's not visible, this is Right. It's only it's only on the back end. It's only in the code. But a lot of content management systems will have a place where you can customize your alt tag, um, and it's primarily used for accessibility for visually impaired people. But it's a great place to insert your keywords also. Um, any links you have in your article, Google likes to see your keywords in your links. Now this link does not have get into your college because it just sounded kind of funny when we put it in there. Um, but the destination for that is get into your dream college dot doc. It's the transcript for that for the podcast. Any meta ta media tags or metadata you can use if you have video or podcast embedded in your article, name that video file with your keywords in there. And that even makes a difference in YouTube. If you're putting a video up in YouTube, name that video something with your keyword in it because YouTube will index that video higher if the keyword is in that. So then if you do everything right, you can get, like I think we're, we uh, vary back and forth between you know number five and number three for Dream College and Google for this article. We drive you know, 20, 30 people a day to this article, which over the course of a year is a lot of content that we're driving in. We're pulling people in to see other things on our site. Yoast is a great plugin for um, WordPress, Drupal, or Joomla. I'm not sure if there are other CMSs that it works for, but basically, super easy plugin to use. You just um, install it, write your content, you scroll down to the bottom, and then Yoast will tell you, you need to increase your keyword volume in your co body copy. Mm -hmm. You need to move your keywords earlier into your header tags. You don't have a keyword in your page title. So you don't have to do everything that Yoast tells you to do, but it's a great way to look at you know, what, it's, what it's recommending based on Google's latest search algorithm. So what's next on the search frontier? Mobile first. Most people always have their phones. Most people can't remember the last time they didn't have their phone. Uh, Google used to say your site should be mobile optimized. This year they're saying your, your site should be mobile first. If your page load speeds are bad, if it takes a long time to load the images and the, the content on your pages, it's going to affect your search engine rankings. Structured data. So your meta descriptions, the summary that comes back when you type your content or when you type your search word into Google, you can add extra things into your meta descriptions by using structured data. Artificial intelligence. Google uses RankBrain, which is their AI, to help rank your pages. Right now, it's a small portion of the kind of algorithm that they use, but they say it's going to get bigger and, and, and take over a lot more of the ranking. And one of the things rank brain, rank brain does to rank your content is it looks to see if your content is useful to people. So you're, you, you come up on the search results, people read your meta description, they click on the page, go to your page. If they leave your page right away, Google's going to know and Google's going to decrease your page rank based on that. So you want to make sure that your meta description matches the content on your page. And remember, that meta description is your call to action. That's the way you can pull people into your page. That's the last 
kind of way that you have on those search results to say, hey, this is what you want, and here's what you're going to see when you come to this page. And voice search, right? Voice is going to be huge. It's growing all the time. Everyone will eventually be using voice, and voice returns one search result. So it's important to try to get as high up in those rankings as you can so that when voice becomes more prevalent, then now you're, you're going to be the one that's getting returned on those searches. Thank you very much. I think that's it. Does anyone have any questions for Sophia or I? We covered a lot. There's still about 15 minutes left, so yeah. Is there a question? Um, so, Rick Gordon from Rick Nielsen. I had a question. So, we, when you talk about writing conversationally, um, for our B2C clients, it makes perfect sense. But when we look at our B2B clients, we often receive a lot of pushback um, on formality and tone. Um, so, do you have any advice for how to approach that? Yeah, so to that I would say, you know, know your audience first. Um, if your particular audience, so I would never advise, for example, faculty when they're submitting um, their research for peer review to use the conversational style. Um, that, that would probably dock them points with their editors at their scholarly magazine. Um, however, uh, when we're looking at their websites, that, that is probably a place where we do want to use the conversational style and finding that balance. So I don't know if that pushback is 